Hey, YouTube. Hey, Arun. Hey, Michael. Hey, fantastic to have you here. Thanks, everybody, for watching live. If you got comments, thoughts, feedback, throw them into the live chat, and we'll try to make them part of the show. With that, let's kick it off. Arun, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Hey, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you here. I saw your book and the title was Data Science at the Command Line. And I thought, okay, that's different. You know, there's a lot of people that talk about data science tools and Jupyter Labs, amazing. And like, if you look over the fence, like our studio and those kinds of things. And yet so much of what we can kind of do and orchestrate and, and create as a building block happens in the terminal and bringing some of these data science ideas and some of these concepts from the terminal to support data scientists, I think is a really cool idea. So we're gonna have a great time talking about it. Yeah, yeah, I, I love to talk about this. Um, and yeah, you're right. It's I still find it an, uh, an interesting juxtaposition of these two terms, data science and, and the command line, one being, uh, well, nowadays, let's say 10 years old, at least the term is, and the mm -hmm. other one, uh, the command line is over 50 years old. Uh, yeah. The command line is, is it's ancient in computer terms, right? It's one of the absolute very first ways of interacting with computers. I mean, you've got cards where you programmed on paper and then you had the shell <laughs> right, right after that. Exactly. Before there were any screens. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah. When we all, when computers were green, they were all green. It was amazing. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into that and it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I just want to also put out there for people who are like, but I'm not a data scientist. So should I check out? I actually think there's a ton of cool ideas in there from uh, just for people who do all sorts of Python and other types of programming. It's not just data scientists, right? No, it, absolutely. And, and I mean, even, I mean, I don't really care much for titles, uh, but even when you're an engineer or a developer, uh, you would be surprised if you really think about how much data you actually work with. I mean, just uh, log files on a server. Um, yeah. those, that's data too. So there are uh, still a lot of opportunities uh, to use the command line, even if you uh, don't consider yourself to be a data scientist per se. Yeah, I, I totally agree. All right, let's start with your story. How do you get into programming and data science and Python? I know you do Python and R and some other things. So how do you get into uh, programming? Yeah, um, it actually started when I, I was about 12 years old. We got this uh, this old computer. Uh, it was already old by then, the two, 286. And um, I opened up this uh, this program, and I, I wanted to to write a story. Um, and I, I was just typing, I was journaling, and then then I got all these error messages. Turns out the uh, the program that I had opened was Q Basic, and it didn't really like what I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then I I started reading the help, and uh, and then I realized like, hey, I can make this computer do things. It just needs a particular language. And that's really how I got into uh, programming. Um, yeah, and then of course there's 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 a whole range of programming languages that then come by. Um, uh, Visual Basic at a certain point, Pascal, Java, C, uh, and you know what? I've forgotten most of it. So uh, this doesn't. If this sounds intimidating, <laughs> then please don't worry. Uh, but yeah, nowadays. Um, Python plays a big role uh, in my uh, professional career. Uh, also R, right? And those two happen to be the, the most popular programming languages uh, for doing data science. Um, and, uh, and JavaScript, uh, obviously, when you're doing some more front-end work. Um, yeah, JavaScript finds its ways into all these little cracks. You're like, why JavaScript? Come on. I was just yeah. looking at, at programmable dynamic DNS as a service. And the way Whoa. you program it is you, I know, and you jam in little bits of JavaScript to make a decision on how to like route a DNS query. I'm like, JavaScript. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm now using Eleventy, which is a oh, yeah, static yeah, yeah. 
a static site um, generator. And ironically enough, it uses JavaScript. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, sure. yeah. That's yeah, fantastic. I've heard really good things about 11D, and I just started using Hugo, which is also a static site generator, but that one's written in Go. And yeah. I just decided I care about writing in Markdown, and I want a static site, and I don't care as long as I run a command on the terminal. Actually, I want to tell a story a little bit about uh, sort yeah. of coordinating over, over the shell for some of these static site things. But I, I decided I don't care if it's the guts of it are in the language that I can program. It's a tool. If it's a good tool for me, I'm going to, I'm going to use it. Okay. So that's how you got into to programming. How about day to day? What are you doing these days? Yeah. So, so at this very moment, I, uh, as we're recording this, I have my own company called data science workshops where I give uh, training um, at, at companies to, to uh, developers and researchers and occasionally uh, managers um, but I have decided, <laughs> uh, to stop with that. So, okay. so uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll actually, uh, uh, join another company. So in the past six years, I have, um, and we can talk about how that company came about and it's, it's probably related to, it's related to everything, of course, but, but, uh, I just want to say that, um, this is actually the very first time that I'm uh, uh, talking about this. But I am I'm going to be a machine learning engineer. OK, um, so there are two two reasons why I decided to uh, to stop with uh, with my own company is that, uh, uh, first of all, I, I really miss working uh, with people, working with colleagues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And secondly, I miss building things. So uh, that's why I'm uh, I'm joining. Uh, well, January 1st, I'm joining uh, Xomnia, a, uh, a consultancy uh, based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Excellent. Well, that sounds that sounds really fun. I also run my own company and I'd really enjoy it, but I, I completely get what you're saying. It's sometimes it's nice to be with a team and you also it makes you learn different skills or hone different skills to show up oh, yeah. at a client company where they've got, you know, a million requests and an hour trying to answer something with machine learning versus you know, doing some research and talking about how to improve the shell, right? These are very two very different jobs. And so it's it's cool to sort of mix mix up the career across those. Say again? It's great to mix up your career and do do some of oh, both, right? Because if yeah. all you did is work at a consultancy, you'd be like, I can't wait to start my own company and do something else. Right, right, right. And and you know, the company was just it just just happened. It, it, that's actually thanks to the book um that i wrote a, 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 a long time ago um i once it was done the first edition that is in 2014 uh and we're talking about data science at the command line here i was asked to give a workshop and uh i'd never given a workshop before but i was asked by a uh, a games company um in barcelona to give a one day workshop and i liked it and i liked it so much that i started doing this more often yeah. Uh, until I decided to do this full time. So um, I didn't choose the, the company life uh, or the, the startup <laughs> life. Although it you can't you. really think of it as a startup. But uh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, these things happen. The, the, independent, the independent life, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. All right, well, let's talk about the terminal. People on Windows might know it as the command prompt, although... You, as I would also recommend that people generally stay away from the command prompt in at least for some of these tools, but we do have the Windows terminal, which is relatively new and much, much nicer, much, much closer to the way the Mac PowerShell, and you mean? Yeah. Well, there's the PowerShell, but then there's also a new Windows terminal application and then it can even do things like bash into Windows subsystem for Linux, right? So if you wanted right. to use some of these tools, you could fire up Windows subsystem for Linux, and then you would literally have the same tool chain because it's just Ubuntu or something. Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, I have, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, WSL, uh, but I haven't tried out this new Windows uh, terminal. The, yeah, the new Windows terminal is pretty nice. Well, let me see if I can pull it up for everybody. Windows terminal, but yeah, it's just in the uh, the Windows 11. Um, store, I guess you call it. I don't know, but it's, yep. it's a lot closer to 
um, a lot closer to uh, the other tools. So if you're on Windows, <laughs> you owe it to yourself to not use cmd.exe, but get this <laughs> instead. So what I want to talk about just real quickly to set the stage is you know, I just I just went through a period of, oh, my computer has been the same setup for a couple of years. It's getting crufty. I'm going to just format it, not restore from some backup, but format it and reset up everything so it's completely fresh and, and like better because I really made some mistakes when I first set it up. Now it's better. But I open up the terminal and it's this tiny font, dreadful white background with white with black text. And it has some old version of Bash. And so I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on like, what do you do to make your terminal better? Right. <laughs> if, and... if you're good, you probably do something. You probably install some extras and other things to make your experience on the terminal nicer. Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing you're on Mac OS then? Yes, the I am. I do Mac OS and I do a Linux for the servers. And right. I think the, some combination thereof is pretty common for most of the listeners. So, so for Mac OS, um, the biggest gain uh, you get when you install iTerm. So okay. uh, a, a different terminal, right? The application that would right. launch your shell. Um, ITerm Mac too. OS term, yeah, the terminal emulator. I, what do they call it? The Mac OS terminal replacement. There you go. Yeah, this is, I'd say, the most popular one on Mac OS. There are others, um, but yeah, that's uh, so. That's what I start with. Uh, you mentioned the shell, which is it still Bash? Is that still the default one? Yeah, on it's still Bash by default. Yeah, yeah, it's, and I think it's an old yeah, version of yeah. Bash. So yeah, uh, there are other shells out there. Uh, the Z shell is quite popular, uh, largely yeah. compatible with Bash. Uh, I've heard good things about Fish. Um, yes, Fish is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which actually um, it's it's not it's not really um, POSIX compliant, as they say. So so it's quite different from what you um, might get from Bash or the Z shell. Uh, but from what I've seen, the syntax, especially uh, looping, uh, might appeal uh, to the uh, to, to Python developer out there. Uh, it, it's closer to Python, uh, but I haven't tried it myself. Um, so, also I'm, the so, uh, con conch shell. Is that how you say it? X O N dot. If you look, if you're willing to give up right. POSIX, then this is like literally Python in the shell. <laughs> You can just type like import JSON and do a for loop yeah. right in the, the, I've never, I've not gone this far. I'm still, I'm on the, uh, on the Z shell side of things. I really like how that works, but if you it's, really wanted to, to embrace the sort of Python in the shell. Exactly. It's this trade off of how far do you want to go? How uh, much do you, do you want to deviate from what is then considered to be the default, right? Because you mentioned you also, uh, work a lot on servers, yeah, right. And and there you're then presented with a completely different uh, uh, shell, perhaps, and, and set of tools. Um, so it would then, yeah, it's it's a trade off. And also, how much time do you really want to spend uh, customizing this? Because um, uh, yeah, our time is precious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And William out in the audience says for the for the Windows people. Oh my posh, which oh, ha, have you done stuff with oh my posh? That's is also really nice. Oh, so I guess posh is for the oh no, any shell, so not just the PowerShell. Yes, this I think it came out of the PowerShell, so the posh part. I think it originally was for that, but I use this with Z shell and oh my ZSH together, and it's basically that controls my prompt, and Z oh my Z shell is like all the plugins and you know, complete your Git branches type of thing. Yeah. But yeah. This, this is really, this is really pretty neat too. Uh, and works well for, for Windows people. I'd say then indeed the, the, um, so if your terminal is one thing where you can get a lot of uh, benefit from uh, uh, customizing your prompt so that it gives you uh, a little bit more information and context of where you are or uh, what your state in which state your Git repo is in or which, uh, in which virtual environment you're working, 
that mm -hmm. can be helpful too, because that is yeah. something that you that that you lose easily when you're working at the command line is is context, right? Um, right. I, I ran this command and it's not working because actually. I forgot to activate the virtual environment so it doesn't have the dependencies or the environmental variables that I set up in that virtual environment, right? Exactly. Let me so, give one more shout out for one other thing while right. people are thinking about making their, their stuff uh, better. Is yeah, great. No, I'm, al I'm always eager to learn these things. Uh, there is so much out there. So nerd fonts, if you're going to get like Oh My Posh and some of these other extensions, that you want to make uh, your shell better, so many of them depend on having what are called nerd fonts. Because if you look at, say, on the Oh My Posh page, there's like these right. these arrows with gaps in them. You're like, what font could possibly have like a Git branch symbol and this, these like connecting arrows that have colors yeah. interwoven? And all that stuff is nerd fonts. So if you're going to oh, try to nice. run them, you download and install one of these nerd fonts and then those will work. Otherwise they're like those, I don't understand Unicode square blocks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, a, Oh, you, know, you still got to install individual fonts. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like you take consolata or something or some other font and, and it's patched with these additional. Some, uh, characters. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So it does, you only need one, but you have to set your terminal to one of these to make a choice set it to one of them and then it'll work but if you don't then it, you'll you'll end up with just like these these a lot of these extensions don't work so yeah 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 um all right yeah, so when it comes to customizing your shell then if you still want to talk about that yeah 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 I, let's let's keep going right um one of the uh, things I, I i think everybody does most often is navigating around uh, so moving from one directory to another. And uh, it can be quite cumbersome to keep on retyping all these long and deeply nested yes. uh, directories. So there are a number of uh, solutions that can help with that. Um, I use FASD, F-A-S-D. Um, okay. That, so that, that, that... Uh, it keeps track right. of what you've been visiting most often uh, and most recently. Um, so, um, and it also, I, I, I don't think if, I wonder if that one also allows you to set bookmarks. That's what I used to do. I would keep, uh, I would have this the, a set of custom shells, uh, shells functions, which actually made, uh, made it into a plugin um, about nine years ago into Oh My Z Shell. So if you if you have oh my z shell and the, the jump plugin is still in there, um, yeah, that's uh, I see. Yep, yep. You can just jump around. I see. Um, yeah, you would say so you would say mark um, yeah. mark this directory under this alias, although it's not really an alias, but it's like a bookmark. And then you say okay, right. jump to, to this directory. So so that really helps. Um, right. So maybe the source directory for talk Python, I would just mark it as TP and I could say on the, sh on the terminal, I could say J space TP and it would take me this super long complex directory. Just bam, you're there. Right. Exactly. So I like, okay. it. And, uh, um, I might need to try this out. And it, it comes with uh, Oh my Z shell. This one. No, this one, it does, doesn't, it's, it's a separate tool. I believe. Okay. Although it might even be a, a plugin. I, by now, I don't even know. It's been it's been a long time <laughs> since I installed it. But yeah. F A S D. That's what you want to look for. Okay. Um, very very cool. Uh, I have uh, uh, one that I use a lot called McFly. Have you oh. have you seen McFly? No. So it's similar, and what you do is you know if you type Control R, it'll give you reverse incremental search or whatever that is. Yeah. And I almost. So this overrides that. So if you type control R, it brings up an Emacs like autocomplete type thing that has fuzzy searching. So you could type nice. SSH and then like part of a domain name and it would find you typed SSH, you know, root at some that, 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 that domain name. And it'll, it'll give you a list of like all these uh, smart options looking through your yeah. history. Yeah. So yeah, that's amazing. And, and, and even now as we talk, I, I've learned like a dozen new things uh, one thing I have noticed, though, is that, you know, you may, 
the next time you're you're installing, uh, you're setting up your system, you may feel very productive and uh, and uh, and lead like, right? <laughs> when you're installing all these tools, but you still got to make use of them, right? You got to turn yeah. it into some kind of a habit. And and what I have noticed uh, for me at least is it, it, what works best is to just take it one tool at a time. Make a little uh, cheat sheet for yourself on a piece of paper, um, and just uh, uh, see if that if you like that tool. If you can, you know, if you get any benefit from it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so related to this, actually, is is the concept of aliases, right? In a more generic sense, in in the pure shell sense, in that yes. you can define an alias that would then be expanded into some uh, command with uh, uh, zero or more arguments. Yeah, so if you have, if you have uh, uh, commands that you would often type, like uh, a la ls for, for listing your, uh, your files, and you have all these arguments that you don't want to keep on typing, then aliases is, is, is the way to go. Uh, I go crazy with aliases. I absolutely yeah. love this. Yeah, I have probably 100, 150 aliases in my um, RC file. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. So at some point, I what you what you well, what you may have done is uh, is go through through your history and then and then see how often you use these aliases. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's always a fun thing to do. Yeah, it's, for me, it's kind of frustration. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this, or you know, I've got to remember, I got to type. Oh no, I got to go into this directory, and then I got to first type this command, and then I can do this other thing. So, for example, we talked about the static site generators. So one of the things I have to do in order to create new content and see how it looks in the browser is I have to go to a certain directory, not where the content is, but a couple up, run hugo-d server mm -hmm. there, and then it'll auto-reload. And as I edit the markdown, it'll just refresh. So instead of always remembering how to find that directory and then go into the right sort of parent directory and run it i just now I just type hugo write and that's an alias and just it does that boom yeah. it just it just pops open and it's okay it's it's running i do my thing I'm gonna, then i gotta do a whole bunch of automation in python on top of it and then build it and ship it to the git and push it for a continuous uh, deployment now i have just hugo publish boom and these are all like aliases the other thing you talked about a uh, single commands is maybe talk about chaining commands and multiple commands yeah, because you just mentioned automation in Python. And then I, of course, immediately go like, hmm, what's going on there? <laughs> can, can calling, on I, yeah, so I've got a couple of, I guess they're Go commands because they're Hugo. And then I've got some Python code that generates a tag cloud and then a Git command that'll publish it. So it's like Hugo, Hugo, Git, no, Hugo, Git, uh, Hugo, Python, Hugo, Git is, is that all in one alias, right? Which is, is beautiful. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. And that, that, you know, I don't know if we've exactly, I guess I opened a little bit talking about your book, but one of the really core ideas of your book is that the shell can be the integration environment across technologies like Go, Python, and Git. Exactly, exactly. The command line doesn't care in what, language something has been written right it's it's like a uh, super glue or, or duct tape more really <laughs> uh <laughs> that that binds everything together <laughs> yeah to a certain That's... extent right like duct tape <laughs> yeah well it's it's a you know loosely bound but it's there's a ton of flexibility in there and if you think well i really just want to do these four things maybe that would be a macro in excel or some kind of like scripting replay in windows but this is it's on the terminal programs can run it you can run it it's clearly editable it's not some weird specific type of macro right you're like i want to do these four things i just type the thing and go uh, i'm yeah. sure many people know but if you have multiple commands you want to run one then the other you can just say ampersand ampersand between them and it'll say yeah. run this first thing and then run the other those are independent. You can also pipe inputs and outputs between them, right? I see that. You, you've got some really interesting ways to do that multi-line stuff in your book as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, so it depends on on uh, what kind of tools you want to combine, right? So you, you just mentioned a double ampersand. So 
that's that should be used when you only want to run the second command when the first one has uh, succeeded, right? If you want to run the second one regardless of what the first one did, you can just use a, a semicolon, right? Or if you only want to run the second um, command when the first one failed, there are, there might be a situation where you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can use uh, uh, double pipe. So for or, okay. yeah, interesting. Okay, and then yeah, and then you just uh, mentioned uh, piping, mm -hmm. and that's well uh, a whole other story. That's when you want to use the output from the first command as input to the second command, and uh, and this is where where, where data uh, again uh, comes into play. Um, and uh, and this is so you just also mentioned macros, right? Uh, another way to, to think of them are are functions, um, right? Uh, that right. you then combine. Um, yeah, incredibly powerful. Um, but that goes a little bit beyond. But then of course you should be working with commands that produce some text that you want to then further you know, uh, 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 work on. Yeah. You also talk about creating bash scripts, which is pretty interesting. I think many people probably know about that or shell scripts, .sh files. I guess it could be Z shell <laughs> scripts as well. Yep. Uh, so you gave an interesting presentation back at the strata conference and, uh, it's, uh, you had a lot of fun ideas that I think are relevant here. So maybe let me just throw out some one-liners and you could maybe riff on that a little bit, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. So one of the reasons you said, you gave 50 reasons that the shell was awesome. And I want to just point out a, a couple, uh, highlight a couple, let you speak to them. So you said the shell is like a REPL that lets you just play with your data. We know the REPL from Python and also from Jupyter, but I never really thought of the shell as a REPL, but it kind of is, right? Yeah, I think that the shell is the, is the mother of all REPLs, <laughs> the read, eval, <laughs> print loop, um, yeah. right? Having this this um, uh, short feedback loop of, of doing things and seeing output and then uh, elaborating on that. I think that is uh, tremendously valuable. And uh, 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 Python users, of course, uh, may recognize this. Uh, from Python itself, right? If you just right. execute Python, you get a REPL, uh, IPython or, or Jupyter console. Um, and to a certain extent, also Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab is, is, is a, there are some similarities there where you again have this quick feedback loop. And it's a very different experience from, you know, writing a script from top to bottom or, or, or starting at the top and then executing that script uh, uh, from the start, uh, every time you want to test something, um, so yeah, it's a different work, different way of working. And uh, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but what I do want to say is that there are situations where uh, having such a, a, a tight feedback loop can be uh, uh, very efficient. Um, yeah, especially in the exploration stage, right? Yeah. Exactly. Once you once you go to production, right? Once you whatever that means, right? Once you want things to be uh, a bit more stable, uh, you don't want to just uh, use duct tape, but you want to use a proper uh, <laughs> construction. <Yes. laughs> then, then yeah, then of course the command line can can have different roles uh, uh, there. Yeah. Yeah, but it's kind of the 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 rad GUI, the rapid application development GUI, but for data exploration, right? The, these REPLs, you know, that's that's partly why Jupyter is so popular. It just lets you play and see and then try. And it just that, that quick feedback loop is amazing. Uh, another reason, you said it's awesome, close to the file system. Yeah, I mean, in the end, it's all files, um, <laughs> right? Whether you're producing code that lives somewhere, it's in a file, or whether you're working with images or, or log files that, are, that get written to something, or you have some configuration that's, it's all files. And we got to do things with these files. We, we have to uh, uh, move them around. We have to rename them, delete them, uh, uh, put them into Git. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah. 
you want to be close to your file system. You don't want to be importing a whole bunch of libraries uh, before you can start doing things with these files. Also, uh, uh, when you're doing data science, often it starts with this kind of ingest and understanding files, right? CSV or text or others. Yeah. Um, I mean, I sometimes try to uh, 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 immediately do uh, read CSV in pandas, um, but then, you know, very, very often uh, I get presented, I get some Unicode uh, error or um, uh, I, 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 it, it, it turns out it's, uh, the comma is not the, the file, uh, is not the, uh, the limiter being used. And yeah, you can do that in a sort of uh, trial and error way. You can fix that, but it really helps to just being able to look at a file as it is, no parsing, just boom, there's yeah. my file. And then, yep, once you're comfortable, once you're you're confident, like, okay, this is uh, what my file looks like. This is its structure. Then, of course, you can always move on uh, to using some other uh, package uh, uh, like Pandas. Okay. Uh, another one that you've said, another recommendation you had or uh, sort of way for playing with this was to use Docker. I don't know how many people out there who haven't done this before are, are really familiar, but basically when you start up a Docker image, you might say dash IT bash or ZSH. And what you get is just, you get a basic shell inside the Docker container. But in that space, then you can kind of go crazy and do whatever you want to the shell and try it out right exactly yeah so so there are two two scenarios that i can think of so when you're just starting out with the command line right it's it's a it's a very intimidating environment and it's quite easy to wreck your system if you're not careful uh so <laughs> being inside an isolated environment um that is sort of shielded of your uh, your host operating system uh can be comforting so that's that's one recommendation uh, that I would say that um, of, of, of why I think you should use Docker. And the other one is uh, reproducibility. Yeah. So uh, in, in in also in Python, right? We're dealing with uh, with packages that get updated, that get different version numbers, where fun where APIs change. And uh, you know, being able to uh, reproduce a certain environment. So that you get consistent results um, is also very, uh, very valuable. Yeah. And I'd like to sort of highlight the converse as well. You said playing with Docker containers is a cool way to experiment with the shell. If you care about Docker containers, you need to know the shell to do things to it. Because you might think, oh, well, I'm just going to make a Docker file. I don't need to know the shell. Like what goes in the Docker file? A whole bunch of commands that many of them look like exactly what you would run on the shell. You just put it in a certain location or as a command argument to some configuration thing in there. So you really, if you're going to do things with containers, the way you speak to them is mostly through shell-like commands, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, so one of the cool uh, tools that you had in, in that presentation was you talked about explainshell.com. Yeah. What is this? Well, it uh, you, you can you can try out. So so what we see here on the screen is is explainshell.com, and it, it will break down a long command and uh, start explaining. Um, so it will exp it will. Um, what I think the authors uh, have done is uh, they have used all these manual pages and extracted um, uh, uh, bits and pieces that they then present to you um, in, a, in, a, in an order that corresponds to the command that you're pasting into this. So if you see, you know, on Stack Overflow, you see this, uh, this incantation and you're like, <laughs> all right, what does it mean? And, and you don't want to go through the manual page yourself. Right. Okay. So what what does dash f mean, and what is what is this x z uh, uh, v f uh, for the tar command mean? Right. Uh, then explain shell can do this trick for you. It's uh, yeah. It's it's amazing. When I first thought, I thought, okay, well, this what this is going to be is this is going to be like the man page. So if you type ls, it'll 
it'll show you a simple list directory contents and you click on it, it'll give you additional arguments you can pass. But right. you could then say, like you said, you could say dash L and it'll say the LS means list contents. The L means use the long listing format. You're like, oh, okay, hold on. What if I said get, get checkout main and it'll say, okay, well, get checkout does this. And then main, it'll actually parse it apart. And there's some really wild examples on here that like right on the page that are highlighted on the homepage of that site, you click it and boom, it gives you this cool graph of like, what the heck? It even shows like the ampersand, the double ampersand and the double or combining as you mentioned before. Yeah. This is, yeah. This is amazing. It is, it is. It's really useful, uh, especially when you're just, you know, uh, uh, getting started with the command line and you're overwhelmed like we all are in the beginning and sometimes still are. Then, uh, you know, adding adding some context like this really helps. Uh, I once wrote a, a utility that allowed you to use explainshell.com from the command line. So you would just, um, uh, uh, you wouldn't leave the command line. I don't think it works any longer, but um, yeah, that was a fun exercise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very neat. One of the things that I learned uh, was parallel. Oh, yeah. So tell us about parallel. Like, this is a command you can run on the terminal. And it right. sounds like it does stuff in parallel. That sounds amazing. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, like the name <laughs> implies. Uh, yeah. So parallel is, is, a, is, a, is a tool. And we're talking about GNU Parallel here. There's another version uh, out there that is similar, but different. And GNU Parallel is this tool that doesn't, doesn't do anything by itself, but it multiplies. It, it, uh, uh, it, it's a force multiplier for all the other tools. So um, what this tool is able to do, it will um, um, parallelize your, your, your pipeline. It will... Uh, be able to um, run jobs on multiple cores and even distribute them uh, to other machines if you have those available, right? So, Michael, you mentioned uh, you're you're working on on a server. Well, if you can SSH in the, if that if you can SSH into other servers as well, you can leverage those. That's something that right, Blue right. Parallel can do. Um, the way it works is that you 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 feed it a a list of something could be a list of file names could be a list of urls could be uh your log files right and if if you can then think of your the problem that you want to solve if you can if you can break break it down into smaller chunks then gnu parallel might be able to help you out there so these yeah. these jobs should be working independently from each other yeah there can be uh, uh, yeah it's nearly impossible to have those two uh, uh, jobs communicate with each other. But let's say you have for your blog, right? In Hugo, mm -hmm. you have a, a whole bunch of, of, uh, of ping files that you want to convert to, uh, to, uh, to JPEGs. WebP or something. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a bad example because this particular tool that I would then use already supports uh, <laughs> doing multiple files, but let's just assume that this tool can only handle one file at a time. Yeah, then you would uh, uh, specify your command, right? And then at certain places where necessary, use placeholders. Like, so, yeah. okay, this is where the file name goes, and this is the file where the file name goes with a new extension. So it's, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite tools, really. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, for example, if you had a bunch of web pages and you wanted to compute the sentiment analysis, right, as a, a data mm -hmm. scientist, right, you want to download it, Compute the sentiment analysis and then save that to a, a CSV or pin it to a CSV. Yeah, you know, and maybe somebody gave you that script and it's only written to talk to one thing, and you don't want to rewrite it or touch it or, or get involved with it. Right? This could this is your your way to unlock the parallels yeah. on there, right? In fact, let, let's talk a little bit more about this because I think it, this is an important point. In that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that we've all come across uh, when we're working in Python and you're thinking like, okay. I can speed this up. I want to do things in parallel. You know what? I'm going to do multi-threading. Or uh, what is it that you use these days in Python? Yeah, async and await, maybe if it's uh, yeah. IO bound or something like that. You've yeah. got your pool of workers or I don't know. Basically, you're, you're programming it yourself from the ground up. 
Right. Multiprocessing potentially would probably Multiprocess. be the closest. Right. 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 Yeah. right. So, so um, the trick then is to realize that there is already a tool out there that can do that for you. All that you need to do is make sure that your, your Python code becomes a command line tool. And we yeah. can talk a little bit more about that, but they're just, there are um, uh, five, six steps needed uh, to, to make that happen. And once you, once you realize that, then you can start uh, uh, turning existing Python code into command line tools and you know, start combining it with, with all the other tools that are already available, in, including uh, uh, Parallel. Yeah, it's awesome. I think it's, it's a really cool idea because you know, maybe the person working with the code doesn't understand multiprocessing and thread synchronization and all these these tricky concepts. Like, just all right, just give me the thing that does it once with command line arguments, and and I got it. You know, like you or you you picked it up from somewhere. Out in the audience, the question is: Is there a gill associated with this? And I mean, technically, yes, but it's not interfering with the computation because it's multiple processes. It's not threads yeah. within a process right so it should be able to just run and take advantage that. of all your cores yeah. yeah there will be one gil yeah. per python process right yep that's right and so it doesn't matter because if you say there's five jobs you have five processes right there's no contention there yep yeah absolutely all right Oh, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about this idea of turning python scripts into command line tools um, yeah, we. Um, I, I think that that's really valuable for people. It is, and um, I think we, we can then put it in the show notes. I might have already given a talk about this. Um, I'm not. I'm actually not sure if it's uh, if it's uh, publicly available. Anyway, there are only a couple of steps, and it's not that difficult. So first of all, let's assume that you have some Python code out there. Yeah, you have it in a file. And uh, let's just, uh, for simplicity's, simplicity's sake, uh, assume it's a single file, right? So what would you then need to do to turn this into a command line tool, something that can be run on the command line? Um, so the, the way that you can currently run this is by saying, okay, Python, and then the name of the file, right? That doesn't really right. sound like it's a, it's a command line tool. So, so the very first thing here then is to uh, add uh, one line, at at the very top, that would then start with a hash and an exclamation mark, or a hash bang, or a shebang, as it's called. These are two special characters, and um, they instruct um, the shell uh, that this is a uh, this can be executed. Yeah. So uh, you would and then. And what is the what is the binary that's gonna? Exactly. Be that's what then right. would yeah. come after that. You know, so you would have hash bang. Uh, uh, and then the, 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 it would point to uh, the Python executable. Yeah. Right. There's some details there. Uh, it could be a really certain version. Good. It could be out of a virtual environment potentially. Like it could go wherever, right? Don't want to overcomplicate um, it probably, but like you could point to, you could point to different versions of Python. You could point, yes. cause you, you give it a full path to the executable. Exactly. Exactly. There's yeah. some there, there's some compatibility issues there, but essentially, is you tell you tell your shell, okay, which program should uh, interpret my code, and mm -hmm. that is some Python out there that you have installed. So th th that's the first step. Um, then, one um, after you've done this, you no longer need to uh, type Python anymore because the file itself. Contains which executable should be uh, should be run, uh, but then you'll notice that you don't have the necessary permissions. Uh, what you need to do is you need to um, enable the execution bit. Yeah, so this um, this would give you as the user permission to actually execute this file. Um, you do that, of course, with a command line tool. It's called Shmod, C H M O D for change mode. And then u plus x, the name of the file, right? These details are, if you're really interested, you, one way, one place where you can find them is in chapter four of my book, Data Science at the Command Line, which you can read for free. Okay, but let's say that you've uh, enabled these uh, the execution bit. Now you can um, now you can run it. Um, you would still need to type 
uh, a period and a slash because this file is presumably not yet on your search path. So your search path is a, is a, a list of directories where um, your shell will be looking for the executable that you want to run. Right? Where is your tool located? Well, it should be somewhere on the search path. So either you add another pa path to the search path or you move the tool to one of the existing directories out there. Um, that's about it for making your code executable. But then you probably want to change one or two things about the code itself. Yeah, so uh, I would... Uh, uh, so, so, one thing to do is look for any hard-coded values that you actually want to be want to make dynamic, right? These should be turned into command line arguments. And actually, you can take that one step further. If you have if one portion of your file is doing something that can be done by another command line tool, then consider removing that. For example, downloading a file. Yeah. There, there is, of course, a tool for that on the command line. Um, uh, why would you then write this yourself? Of course, there's a time and a place for that. But let's say, okay, a, a very um, <laughs> um, contrived example is, is a, a Python program that would count words. Yeah? Right. Right? If, you, if your code has some hard-coded website, yeah? I mean, why... It would be you would make your tool um, more generic by getting rid of that hard coded URL and well turn it into a command line argument. Okay, which website would you like to download? Or to go one step further is to think, okay, you know what? I don't really care where the text is coming from. I I just want to count words. So yeah. uh, give me text somehow. Yeah. Sorry. Just give me the text. Don't tell me the URL. Yeah. yeah. So your tool should then be reading from standard input, which is a special channel um, from which you can receive data. Now, um, and this is also where the piping would come in. Yeah, so you would first use a tool that would get this text, right? Maybe it's some log file, so you wanna count your errors or um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's another website and you wanna uh, 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 do stuff to that. <laughs> uh, doesn't really matter, but um, you would then, that would write to its standard output, yeah? And you would combine the standard output from the first tool with your standard input using the pipe operator. So that's that's then basically it for, for I mean, of course, um, if you wanna take this further, you can think about, you know, adding some help, some nice looking help. Yeah. Think about the arguments themselves. Do you wanna use short options or long options, um, exactly. Uh, right, so, something like Typer or Click or, or one of these formal yes. CLI frameworks. Yeah. You probably Python, really... Python, of course, uh, has arc parse, um, uh, but there are uh, packages out there that can, uh, that can really help you build beautiful command line tools. Uh, Typer is one of them. I'm currently using Click. Uh, also, yep. Click in combination yep. with uh, Rich. Um, mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, the author of Rich uh, was on the show uh, a couple of episodes ago. Yeah, Will McGugan. Yeah. Very good stuff. Yes, uh, why, why we're talking about that, you know, the other thing that's really uh, pretty interesting is the Rich CLI. Have you played with Rich CLI? Which, oh, oh yeah. Okay, so it's a, that's indeed a command line tool in itself. That can do a whole bunch of things. Yeah, uh, you wanna you wanna tell us something about that? I, you know, I haven't done much with it, but you can do things like if you install the rich CLI, then you can say things. Um, there's lots of ways to install it. You could say like rich, and then a Python file or a JavaScript file or a JSON file, and it'll give you pretty printed color, you know, syntax highlighted <laughs> printout. You can say uh, rich some CSV file and it'll give you a formatted table inside your terminal with colors and everything of, of it, it understands markdown and it like renders markdown and yeah. uh, there's, there's all sorts. So if you're kind of exploring files and you're happy with Python things and like installing the rich CLI is a, a pretty neat way to go as well. Yeah. It's a nifty tool, but just not to get confused. Um, 
this so this tool is provided by rich and it uses rich to produce you know <laughs> nice looking output but just imagine that you can write your own command line tools yes. that would also produce this nice looking output and for that you can then use this package called rich right in combination perhaps with things like typer or click and uh, uh doc opt is another way you can go there there are so many tools out there uh, yeah, really. there, there absolutely are. One other thing I would like uh, to to point out that so this taking the script and making it executable and put it in the path that's kind of a it's a great way to take scripts that you have and make them CLI commands for you. If you want to like formalize this a little bit more, I recently ran across this project called. Uh, the Twitter archive parser. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of turmoil at Twitter. And so what you can do mm -hmm. is you go to Twitter and download your entire history of like thousands of tweets or whatever as yep. uh, a, a HTML file and some JSON files, and you can save them for yourself. But the content of like all of the links are the shortened two.co Twitter short links. And if Twitter were to go away, you'd have no idea what any of your links you've ever mentioned ever were. <laughs> and also the images that you get are the low res images and you can get the high res images if you know how to download them. So this guy, Tim Hutton, created this really cool utility that you can, down you can take that downloaded archive and upgrade it to standalone with high res images and full resolved links, not shortened links. Pretty cool, right? But if you look at the uh, the way to, like, how do you use it? Okay, where does it say this? Uh, I'm not sure where it is. Yeah, so how do I use it? I download my Twitter archive and unzip it, fine. And then I download the, the Python file to the working directory. And then I go in there and I type Python that file. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be better if I could just... You know, it has dependencies it has to install in order for it to run. Wouldn't it be better if I could just use this as a command? So what I did is I forked this and I said, I'm going to add a pyproject.toml to turn this into a package. And then under the pyproject.toml, you say project.scripts, Twitter archive markdown, Twitter archive images, and you, you map into your package and then functions that you want to call. And then once you pip install this, it these these commands become just CLI commands. And it doesn't matter how that happened, long as your Python packages are in the path, which they generally have to be anyway, because you want to do things like PyTest and Black, then if you just pip install this project, it, it adopts all these commands here, which is pretty cool. Nice. Is it then necessary yeah. to add this bin directory once to your search path? Because it lives, it would live somewhere on their site packages, right? Yes, exactly. And so if you have a, a Python installation and you try to pip install something, you'll get a warning that the site packages are not in the path. So you do have to do that. And then go one further, you could do pip x. I don't know if you played with pip x. Pip x is awesome. So it'll generate the, the package environments and install the dependencies in an isolated environment. And it'll set up the path if you just say intro path. Then, so if you pipx install the thing with the the commands in it, those automatically get managed and upgraded by pipx as just part of your CLI, which like that's a perfect chain of like a for, but you've got to have a formal package and, and like a place to install it from like Git or PyPI or whatever. But it's still it's still a, a like a neat pro level type of thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, you can take this pretty far, um, make it really <laughs> professional. Uh, and before you know it, you start maintaining it for, <laughs> but, exactly. um, you know, what am I doing PRs to, on this silly thing? I don't know. Yeah. But just to clarify, if you say for a one-off or a two-off, you want to, you want to make something that is reproducible, right? So, so a reusable command line tool, not reproducible, reusable, you don't really need uh, any other yeah. packages you can just use uh, you, you, you can use uh, sys.argv right you, you import yeah. sys yep. and then you have your sys I, I do that I do that a fair amount of times it's, yeah it's not it's, it's only for me I've created an alias so it always gets the right argument there's like there's no ambiguity it's sysargv bracket one let's go exactly yeah. yep yeah 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 for sure all right so I, I 
we've talked a lot about uh, sort of around all the cool things we can do with a command line, but in your book, you actually talked about a bunch of surprising tools. So like one of the things you talked about is uh, obtaining data and you hinted at this before, like you can just use curl for, for downloading those kinds of things. But if you get a little bit farther, like under scrubbing data, you've, um, you talk about Grek, grep and awk that a lot of people maybe know, but then if we go a tad further over to say exploring data, then all of a sudden you can type things like head of some CSV file and it kind of does the same thing as Jupyter or uh, there's um, things like CSV cut and, and SQL CSV, CSV SQL. Talk about some of these maybe more direct data science tools that people can use. Right. So let's see then where to begin. Um, <laughs> what you just meant, so you, 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 you mentioned a couple of tools, right? The head and awk and grep. Those are, you know, I would consider them the classic command line tools, yeah, right? Part of too, yeah. core utils, GNU core utils, right? You can, if you, if you're, uh, if you have a fresh, uh, uh, install, then you can expect those tools to be present. Yeah. Um, if you're not on windows. So, um, those tools, they operate on text on plain text and they have no notion of, uh, any other structure that might be present in this data, S say, uh, CSV for when you have some rectangular, uh, structure or JSON when you can have a potentially deeply nested data structure. Mm -hmm. These tools know nothing about that. Um, that doesn't make them entirely useless, right? There are ways to work around them, uh, around that um, that issue. But there are uh, nowadays plenty of tools available that are able to work with this structure, right. and. Um, one of them uh, is a is actually a suite of tools. It's called CSV Kit, and uh, you can install it as a Python package um, okay. through pip, which of course we do at the command line. And um, and then you CSV have CSV Kit. You say, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh huh. And uh, then you you get a, a whole bunch of tools that understand that you know. Uh, lines are rows. The first line is a header, uh, and uh, and the, all these fields are delimited by default by with a by a comma. Um, and then you can do things like like uh, uh, extract uh, columns or sort a file according to a certain column. Um, yeah. So so this is more difficult for when you're working with. Um, uh, the um, <clears throat> the core data utils, and of course, all of these these things you can do in pandas, and uh, it might even be faster in pandas uh, as opposed to these CSV tools, uh, not as opposed to the uh, the classic command line tools. But um, I mean, in order to get started with pandas, right? Just this, imagine that you're you're given this file, you know, your uh, by your colleague. And you're you're asked to quickly uh, sum things together. Right? In order to just get started with pandas, uh, what are the, then the things that you need to do? Yeah, fire up Jupyter Lab, uh, import pandas, uh, maybe a bunch of other things. There is, um, of course, also a time and a place for that. Definitely, definitely. I always use the tool that gets the job done. Don't get me wrong here, but it's just so incredibly powerful to just if if you if it solves the job to just whip up uh, a, a command you know uh, on the on the command line uh, using uh, a couple of, of tools there um, if you're going that route then CSV kit is not the only uh, suite of tools that you should know about uh, XSV uh, written in rust um, but yet you shouldn't care about that because the command line doesn't care. Yeah, but it's it's uh, generally faster. Uh, one thing that CSV Kit can do, uh, by the way, and I'm actually kind of proud that I have been able to contribute uh, that tool to the suite of tools, is uh, CSV SQL, and it allows you to um, 
uh, yeah, run a, a SQL query directly on the CSV file. Yeah, so if you are, are familiar with, uh, with uh, SQL, then uh, you can leverage that knowledge directly at the command line without first having to create a new database and import that CSV file in there and so forth. All right. So one of the things you can do on the command line is basically just give it like, here's a SQL light file database and now go insert all the things from the CSV file into it. Uh, here in this example, it has this create table statement. Does it figure that out from the CSV or do you need to write that? Um, it figures it out. Yeah, it does some, um, it, it looks at the first, say a thousand rows and then figure out like, okay, this is a number. This is I text. see. Yeah. Oh, cool. Wow, that's uh, really cool. But, but I was actually talking about the other tool and that's SQL to CSV. I always mix those up. The reverse, uh, yeah. SQL, uh, yes, exactly. This one. Uh, and, and there, it, it still uses SQLite under the hood, but you don't need to worry about that. It takes care of, the, of all that boilerplate for you. You just say, okay, uh, you know, select these columns uh, from standard input, uh, order them by this column, um, and this is this is the file, or, or, or I've piped um the, yeah the, that's cool uh, yeah yeah so yep yeah it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah i mean maybe you've got like some production database and you want to filter out i just need this table with this particular query right it's like i only want to focus on my region of this data give it to me as a csv file and then you can go work on it all you want you don't have to be connected to the database or near it or any of those things, right? Potentially, if it doesn't have any sensitive data, you could share that, right? You would never share the connection string to your database. That'd be insane. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very cool. So, what are some of the other tools? Well, if we go back, uh, if I go back to the CSV kit, you can see there's um, some of these you talked about. There's into CSV. That one takes an Excel. Uh, X, X, XSL or XSLX and converts it to a CSV just on the command prompt or the terminal, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Also, I should I should point out that I'm not the uh, the author of of CSV Kit, right? I just contributed a very yeah, small yeah. portion to it because of the ingredients that were already there. Uh, still proud of it though, but it's um, it's 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 uh, being created by my many other uh, people. Uh, sure, of course. Some other things it has is like um, CSV stat and CSV grep. Yeah, a lot of a lot of cool command line options to point at these things, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see. I pulled out uh, some others. Um, let's see here. Rush. So one of the areas that um, the, the the graph, the basically plotting. Two, two, we're basically out of time, but I want to I want to talk about two things really quick. Um, right. Uh, the uh, some of this. Like, which chapter did you put under where you have the the pictures? Uh, seven. Uh, so seven. Visualizing, exploring data, and then it's yeah. Uh, here we go. Got it. Here. So if you so tell us a little bit about this. Like you can you can plot stuff in your terminal. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. And uh, you know what? I, I, I should say that Rush is a proof of concept, right? It's one of those projects that have a lot of potential, but don't necessarily have enough users. Uh, and, and, and I don't necessarily have enough time to maintain it properly, but it does, it, it does uh, uh, prove the concept, prove the concept. So yeah. Rush, the name, I mean, it's for when you're in a rush. It's R on the shell. Um, and um, it, what it does, it, it leverages R under the hood. Uh, and uh, for plotting, it leverages a particular R package, uh, ggplot2, mm -hmm. which is the data visualization package for when you're working with R. Yeah, uh, kind of the... The sibling, uh, where matplotlib is a little bit derived from that, I believe, right? Well, 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 
now you're mentioning that actually uh matplotlib is is very different it's uh it's, uh, it's matplotlib is very low level and gives you a lot of flexibility um but also requires a lot of work now if you're um if you want to visualize data uh, in python uh in a similar way that ggplot uh uses uh then i can recommend plotmine so that's a Python package that is uh, modeled after ggplot2's API. But um, th that was a little bit, a little segue there. Now, somebody else um, created a backend for ggplot that allows you to create visualizations on the command line. Um, what I then did was create this interface. So something that would, uh, uh, translate arguments and their values uh, to the appropriate uh, function call, and also does a lot of boilerplate when it comes to reading in uh, the, uh, the CSV file that you provide, right? If you were to do this in R itself, it would require, let's say, about five lines of code in order to get started, right? You, and and the, the, the same holds for Python, right? So similar concept, right? Um, mm -hmm. Import the appropriate packages or modules, um, um, reading in some file, and, and there's there's all this setup. And you know, there again, that is probably what you want when you want things to be a little bit more robust, but when you want to get stuff done quickly, yeah, it really helps to be able to do that as a one-liner on a command line. And this is where Rush would then come in. So I make use of all this, um, yeah, uh, elaborate um, uh, machinery, you know, in R <laughs> just to uh, use that at the command line. So it's like a, a beautiful little wrapper around this complex thing. It, it like really hides, wrapper. hides the compl complexity, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you can do beautiful like bar plots. There's there's a lot of neat stuff in here. I really like this. It is it is really nice. And um, yeah, I, I, now that I see this again, uh, I, I get excited again. Um, there is definitely potential there. But, you know, it's, it's again, yet another open source project that has to be uh, <laughs> maintained. And unfortunately, I... Uh, my time is limited, like uh, like everybody else's. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. All right. The last last thing we have time for is this polyglot data science. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. So polyglot data science is the idea that you that uh, in order to get things done, you might need to use uh, multiple tools, multiple languages, really, and uh, throughout the book. Uh, so up until then, up until that chapter, I have, we have mainly been focusing on um, using other languages from the command line. But this chapter um, considers uh, consider the other way around, right? Using the command line from another language. So there might have been a situation where you're working in Python and then uh, all of a sudden, like, oh, now I got to do this, this regular expression, or I got to do some globbing, and uh, or I got to call, I have to call this this other tool, yeah, um, uh, that is not written in Python, but can be called from the command line, right? You would maybe use subprocess, the subprocess mm -hmm. module for that. Uh, these are situations where you want to leverage the command line, where you want to break out of Python and uh, do parts of your computation on the command line. And in that chapter, uh, chapter 10, I demonstrate uh, this not only for Python itself, but also in other uh, uh, languages and tools, including Jupyter uh, Lab, where you can, can pass around, uh, say, a variable as standard input, or and also retrieve the output then so that you can continue working in Python again with, uh, with the output. So, um, and and uh, what is still very interesting to me is that even new languages and tools uh, somehow still offer a way to leverage the command line. So so Spark Apache Spark has a pipe uh, method 
where you can pass an entire data set, right, an RDD, uh, uh, through uh, a command line tool. And that, I think that is just, um, it is a, um, maybe it was just a, a fun little hack what the authors did, I don't know. Uh, I, I try to, to view it as a, as a compliment, like, okay, some, sometimes we just need to go back to the basics and, and yeah. use the command line because once you're there, you're, you're back in this environment where you can use everything else. So All right. everything we've spoken about so far is now accessible as a command, be it exactly. Go or Python or your own script or whatever. Exactly. So let's say you've written this, you, you, you've come across this really nice tool, but it's written in Ruby. Oh no. What you're going to, what are you going to do? <laughs> are you, you going to all of a sudden become, uh, you know, uh, involved into Ruby? No. Uh, assuming that this tool can be used from the command line, you can of course relax, just use the sub process module and still you incorporate that Ruby tool into your own script. That's the idea. Yeah. I do want to maybe point out just really quickly here, like this has got a little bit of a, a little Bobby tables warning asterisk by it, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> right. So for example, one of the things that's awesome here is I could run Jupyter console as you show. And then if you say exclamation mark command that pumps it straight to the shell. So you could say bang date and it would tell you the date. you could say bang pip install dash dash upgrade request. And that'll go and execute that command. Don't do that with user input, <laughs> right? Because who knows what they're going to mm -hmm. send you. Um, you can also Definitely. do that within Jupyter Notebooks, you point out, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do, um, what is it, percent, percent bash. And then some interesting, complicated thing there, right? That's, that's <laughs> well, yeah, awesome. yeah, that's indeed the, uh, the magic uh, command that you can use in, uh, in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, right. And then the entire cell is bash. Yeah. And so then you take what's left of that and then you head over to explain shell and figure out what the heck it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe do that before you run it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. And then uh, also in, in Python, um, using um, sub process is something that mm -hmm. I've done several times. You know, um, I need to automate generating some big import of say 150 video files across a bunch of directories to build a course that we're going to offer. Well, into the database, I have to put how long is each one of those? I have no idea how to, to get the duration out of an MP4 <laughs> or mm -hmm. MOV file. But you know what? There's a really cool command line uh, file uh, program I can run. And it'll tell me. So I just use subprocess and call that. And then I can script out the rest in Python. And it's, you know, subprocess is not to be underestimated, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, at a certain point, shell scripts uh, uh, can get a little bit too hairy to work with. Being able to automate your things and use Python as your super glue, right? So a little bit stronger than duct tape, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We talked at the beginning about how you're in this exploration stage and you just want to just run a bunch of stuff on the command line and figure it out. But when you go to production and you said, whatever that means, like this could be one of one thing that it means. We're going to write formal Python code and then use sub process to kind of bring in some of this functionality potentially. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the command line is by definition very ad hoc, right? Yeah. In nature. Uh, still. If you're doing things in production, meaning you're interacting with with other environments, with with uh, servers, or you have some kind of uh, continuous integration going on, there are these places. These are places where the command line keeps popping up, yeah. right? So uh, even there, so there is it. It is useful to at least be comfortable uh, with this. Uh, with this uh, stark and unforgiving environment. <laughs> I think it's really excellent. I think there's a lot of cool stuff uh, that we talked about. I think there's a lot of, a lot of value for people to learn this, I guess, you know, maybe we close this out with just one comment that I remember from your strata presentation. You said the command line is like wine. <laughs> it maybe takes a while to appreciate, but it gets better with age. And <laughs> I, I certainly, my first experience was like, okay, I'm going to go from Windows and Mac dev development over to setting up and running servers over SSH. It was like, 
I am beyond lost. <laughs> I have no idea even like just how to get started right many years ago. And, and now it's like, well, of course that's a beautiful way. And it just, you slowly build up these, these skills and it's, it's really lovely. Yeah, it is. No, it took me a long time to get comfortable with the command line actually, or Linux, uh, in a more generic sense. I, yeah. for the longest time I was running windows and Linux in a, in a, in a dual boot machine. And so <laughs> I, I, I just couldn't make the jump. And this was uh, uh, over 10 years ago, but uh, no, it didn't, definitely didn't come overnight and I wasn't born with it. So, but I, def I also believe that everybody, uh, you know, is able to, uh, to embrace uh, the command line, if you will. Um, but you just gotta, you know, make, your, make yourself a little bit comfortable there as well. We talked about that in the beginning, right? The right terminal, the right aliases can get you a long way. Uh, they get you so far and, and tools like, um, oh, my Z shell and some of these others, um, mm. the, the fast that will help you remember the thing you needed to type or, or like you said, aliases and kind of bring it all together. And like, ah, I know I did that thing. Let me just do a quick search for, <laughs> yeah, there it is. Five years, you know, five weeks ago I ran this and that's how I, this is how I restart the web server. Oh yeah. Now I remember. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can talk about this all night. I, uh... I think I think we're probably out of time, though. Let me ask you the final two questions before you get out of here. Um, if you're going to do some editing or write some code, what editor do you choose these days? I am torn between Visual Studio Code, um, Doom Emacs, and NeoVim. <laughs> and I, um, <laughs> but wherever I am in these editors, I always have my Vim key bindings set up. So it kind of depends on the project. Um, but yeah, as long as I have my Vim key bindings, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Notable, uh, normally I ask Notable PyPI project or, or library, but maybe broaden a little bit. Like if you could recommend one tool, one library people could install for the uh, command prompt of the shell, what, what would you say? Um, one, one tool or one command line tool for that they could install on the shell. Just do uh, something. It doesn't have to be the most popular. Something like people, if I ran across this, it was delightful. People should know about X. Yeah. Um, Canoe Parallel. Let's do it. Let's, uh, yeah. yeah. We talked about it, yeah. so it doesn't require any further ex explanation. It's the tool that, that you know, uh, makes every other tool way cooler. Uh, yeah, so yeah, if you have that one in your arsenal, uh, you can become very powerful. <laughs> That's good, re good recommendation. All right. Well, final call to action. People are excited about this. They want to learn more about it. What do you tell them? Yeah. A couple of things they can do. Um, so my book data science at the command line is freely available. Yeah. So the second edition came out, uh, a year ago. You can read it for free on uh, data science at the command line .com. Um, I also offer a cohort based course that I uh, do uh, uh, twice a year. Um, the next cohort is coming up in April. And this is, um, yeah, there we, we have six live sessions and then I will, uh, I help, you know, a group of, researchers and developers, um, you know, embracing the command line. It's a, a, a very different experience than uh, reading a book. Um, if you want to know more about that, then also data science at the command line .com, uh, has a link to that. Um, apart from that, yeah, I mean, if you just follow Hacker News, you'll come across, uh, now that you're aware of, the, of all these tools, you'll come across quite a lot of tools every now and then there's there doesn't go there, uh, there's not a week um in which there's not a tool uh, being mentioned there are tools being developed every day it uh, even though it's uh, you know the technology is over 50 years old it's in, impossible to keep up but um it's only it, getting cooler say again it's only getting cooler it is only getting cooler yeah. uh definitely so uh yeah 
that's my uh, my recommendation there. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks for being here. It's been great. Congrats thank on you. The, the, the book and putting all this together. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, you bet. Bye. Bye-bye.